Okay, well, I guess I, I guess we can get started. Um, uh, welcome everybody to the fall virtual meeting, uh, once postponed uh, for the Bone Marrow Stem Cell Transplant Committee for SWAG. Uh, we have two hours and I'd like to welcome everybody uh, and uh, appreciate all the uh, presenters uh, sending in their slides in advance so we can get everything organized and hopefully move through this rather quickly. There are going to be some minor changes to the agenda, but uh, I think we're ready to get going. So um, we're going to talk about the active protocols and give some updates, the pending trials, and then concept dis discussions, and hope we can get all this done within a two-hour time limit. Um, so I would tell people um, that if you have a question, uh, especially during the presentation, to use the chat function, we'll be monitoring this. And um, if you have a specific question that you'd like to have answered before we move on to the next presentation, that's the time to do it. Uh, we're not going to have opportunity to uh, turn people's mics on and off because we're not going to get through everything. So let's get started. We're going to talk about SWAG 1803, the phase three in intergroup led by SWAG of uh, DARA plus LEN versus LEN uh, post auto transplant maintenance for multiple myeloma. And the PI is Amrita um, Krishnan, who's on an airplane. And so I will be doing this uh, uh, presentation uh, for you all. Next slide then. And we're going to go through this uh, kind of quickly um, the, on the basis of time. Uh, uh, so next slide. So uh, the rationale, as everybody knows, is that LEN maintenance is uh, standard of care, improves progression free and overall survival. Duration of therapy um, is unknown, uh, uh, optimal duration. Uh, and this is a trial in which we add to the lenalidomide in half the patients daratubumab to see if this will improve long-term uh, survival as it appears to improve minimal residual disease negativity over that of LEN and DEX alone. Um, and uh, as many of you know, it is being studied in other uh, trials, including the Italian trial where there was a suggestion of improvement in outcome. Next slide. So this is a, uh, uh, an update of the Cassiopeia uh, a trial, and again, which uh, DARA monotherapy is given as maintenance versus observation. Next slide. And uh, reduced intensity DARA maintenance with a two year fixed duration, improved uh, progression free versus observation. As you can see, that uh, significantly. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, trial did not have a Revlimid comparator arm. Next slide. Uh, this is the uh, Persuius trial, uh, DVRD versus VRD in transplant eligible patients, in which again, the maintenance um, is uh, uh, Revlimid plus daratubumab minimum 24 months. If uh, they're MRD positive, they continue. If they're MRD negative, uh, they do stop. And a primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Next slide. Uh, the Aruga trial, um, butchering all these names, probably DARA plus LEN versus LEN alone as maintenance, uh, who are MRD positive after frontline uh, transplant is also ongoing. Um, DARA uh, doses is, are given there, uh, very similar to what we are doing here. Uh, so it's DARA plus REV versus Revlimid. Again, primary endpoint is MRD conversion rate uh, from baseline to, to one year uh, after maintenance therapy as determined by NGS. Next slide. And this is the dramatic trial. So uh, patients are given, uh, as you know, uh, LEN 10 milligrams continuously. Uh, if tolerated, can be dose escalated starting in cycle four uh, with or without DARA at standard doses, uh, cycles one and two weekly, and then cycles uh, three uh, and, and going on is uh, 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 monthly only. Uh, MRD assessment at two years. If it's positive, you continue the uh, treatment arm. If it's negative, the patients are randomized between continuing and stopping. The primary endpoint is overall survival, um, and it will be, again, a comparison between the, 
patients randomized to LEN versus LEN uh, DARA. Next slide. 950 eligible patients, a total of 1,100 registered to screening. Primary endpoint, again, is overall survival, and uh, it's an 84% power to detect a median improvement between 10 to 15.7 years. There are three interim analysis, 25% of events, which is about 4.3 years, 50%, 6.2 years, and 75% at eight years. The primary analysis is at 10 years. Many of us will no longer be um, seeing, caring for patients, or maybe even here. Uh, but patients will be followed for up to 15 years. Secondary endpoints, progression-free survival, MRD analyses. Next slide. So here's where we are. Again, the goal is 1,100 patients registered. We are uh, more than half there. Uh, as of September, 608 patients registered and 533 have been registered, randomized already to maintenance. Uh, and in fact, the first group of patients are coming up to uh, step three, which is again, randomization based on MRD at 24 months. So uh, we are doing extremely well with accruals. Uh, things are going very smoothly. There's been very little in the way of issues or uh, problems. Next slide. Uh, so eligibility updates, uh, again, registration one uh, can be pre or post transplant. Uh, they cannot be refractory to DARA and or LEN. Uh, confirmed diagnosis requiring induction therapy prior to transplant. Measurable disease is at myeloma diagnosis. They must have completed transplant within 180 days of initial registration. And registration three, again, as we just talked about, is after 24 months of maintenance. Uh, as many of you know, there was a COVID amendment in which registration could be uh, um, uh, done within 18 months from transplant um, rather than 180 days, uh, 270 days prior to step two. And we would allow for six months of LEN maintenance alone before registering to uh, uh, step two, which is the randomization, and allow for up to eight weeks of DARE 2 MAB delay for patients on maintenance for specific issues. Next slide. So uh, I think one of the biggest uh, issues that I have heard about over the last uh, six months is the requirement for patients to be seen on a Q4 week basis indefinitely or as, lo as long as they're on therapy. And certainly for the first two years, we are hearing from big centers that these patients are doing well. They're clogging up, if you will, the clinics. Uh, and this is not standard of care to see these patients every four weeks in an ongoing fashion. We brought this up to the leadership of the, uh, of the protocol. Uh, they are going to have a meeting in short term. The goal is to have uh, uh, a modification to allow for more of a standard of care approach for patients in which patients will be seen monthly for the first six months, plus or minus. And then uh, as little as every three months, if they're otherwise stable, they will, however, because the primary endpoints uh, progression are important here, or the secondary endpoints of progression are important here, um, the patients are going to be have to get their labs done on a monthly basis. Not going to be a problem for those that lenalidomide and daratubumab patients because they're coming in once a month. But for the lenalidomide patients, they will definitely need to have their blood drawn um, for analysis. And we'll have to get into the weeds, if you will, as far as where that blood can be drawn and how it's going to be drawn. But uh, uh, I think there's going to be some relief for all of us who see a large number of these patients and have them on maintenance. So for the time being, please continue to enroll patients in this uh, important trial. Uh, the quicker we uh, get the trial enrolled, the quicker we can uh, get to uh, the endpoint, uh, ultimately, which is survival, but uh, MRD negativity. And there is some hope that based on ongoing trials uh, showing uh, importance of MRD negativity, that uh, we'll be able to come up with some uh, answers for all uh, long before we uh, look for survivals endpoint. Uh, unless there are any specific questions uh, or issues with this, um, um, we'll move on. Uh, again, please uh, let Amrita know, or you can always email me and I'll make sure that the committee uh, gets your questions. It's pstiff at lumc.edu. 
So let's move on to the next trial. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the Alliance 051301, which is a randomized double blind phase three trial of abrutinib during and following transplant versus placebo in patients with relapse refractory DLBCL, the ABC subtype. Next slide. This trial has been going on a long time. It's also co shared by the BMT CTN at 1201. Um, the chair is uh, Babis Andreas uh, at uh, uh, UCSF. Next slide. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this trial. Patients who have relapsed refractory DLBCL, the ABC subtype, who get uh, with salvage therapy a PR or better, are randomized between a transplant, either the SWOG CBV or BEAM plus or minus a brute nib during the prep regimen and then uh, as maintenance for uh, 12 cycles. If patients on the placebo arm progress, they can then get uh, a brute nib uh, monotherapy uh, as treatment uh, at the time of progression. Next slide. Uh, eligibility is pretty standard. They have to either progress on frontline therapy or are uh, re refractory to first line therapy, but obviously have responded to salvage therapy. No more than three prior therapies for large cell prior boot is allowed as long as there's been no progression for patients. No CNS lymphoma, again, chemosensitive, uh, no HIV positive lymphomas, no active hep B, hep C, and no bleeding uh, strokes or anticoagulation with warfarin. Next slide. Um, the Amendment 6 came out uh, over well over a year ago, and this uh, protocol was changed as uh, we were using nano uh, string technology to identify the ABC subtype. We screened a huge number of patients, and very few patients actually went on for a variety of reasons because there was central pathology review in the nano strings, and sometimes it just took too long. Um, so now we are going to be using the Hans algorithm uh, slides, uh, six unstained or stained slides. Um, h &E, CD10, BCL6, MUM1 are sent to Cleveland Clinic. Turnaround uh, five days is guaranteed and it's usually much quicker. If the slides are stained locally, they just review them. If they're not stained, um, then uh, you send the block or the block alternative uh, to uh, Cleveland. Uh, you can still send for nano string. Uh, this is optional, not required by the protocol. Next slide. So relatively easy. And again, beam or CBV conditioning, uh, brutinib during that prep regimen, and then uh, weekly follow-up till day 29. And uh, then uh, once patients and graft are put on the maintenance or on uh, placebo, uh, a brutinib. Next slide. 560 milligrams, start between day 30 and 60. Um, next slide. Uh, again, there is a crossover uh, at progression. Patients are unblinded and 12 cycles of active drug are provided by the protocol. Uh, and again, we're measuring response rate to this as well as secondary progression-free survival and overall survival. Next slide. Uh, so this was activated um, five years ago. Uh, first pa patient was registered uh, uh, close to that. Uh, we did a safety run in and the trial was officially opened in 2017 as of 2010, despite hundreds of patients being um, uh, registered, only uh, 84 were treated. Um, and there had been a box approximately uh, 50 plus after amendment six, average of two per month currently. Next slide. Primary endpoint, um, the total uh, was designed to be um, uh, quite high. And uh, this is a change that is in the works. Uh, approximately twice as many patients were in the original trial design. However, um, um, because the trial is languishing a bit, uh, discussions have been had with CTEP about uh, modifying this um, uh, 
trial design. So we have approximately 80 patients on study and the total N will be decreased to approximately 160. So it will still take uh, a while to accrue. Um, and uh, again, for, for those uh, who have entered patients on this trial, it goes rather smoothly, but the trial is languishing a bit. Um, and I guess the question is um, whether or not we'll ultimately complete the trial. Um, again, for chemosensitive patients, um, this is a little bit different than um, uh, Zuma 7. Um, that we all know that uh, results um, for that uh, top line showed improvement in outcome for CAR T, and this certainly will impact some of the patients. But again, these are predominantly patients who have uh, relatively chemosensitive, non bulky disease for whom transplant, in many people's opinion, is still the standard of care, less, uh, less. Uh, Less so for patients with refractory disease or a big bulky disease that does not enter a complete remission with salvage therapy. So again, uh, our hope is that you'll consider to uh, consider uh, putting patients on this trial. Again, with only 80 patients to go, we should be able to complete this in um, approximately a year to a year and a half. And then we'll know for patients who are otherwise healthy, whether or not a root nip can improve the outcome of these patients uh, to give equivalent outcome to perhaps uh, doing the much more expensive and potentially more toxic uh, CAR T therapy. Next slide. So without any questions, I'm not seeing any in the chat. Uh, again, uh, as I said, the trial seems to be uh, slowly plugging along. Um, we had uh, a good month in the uh, good months in the spring. Um, but again, over the past few months, it's fallen back a bit. Uh, please, if you haven't opened this and you see these patients, consider them. We have done uh, these patients at our center. It really is quite easy to get patients into the trial and get your analysis back from uh, Cleveland Clinic. So without any questions, let's move on to pending trials. Uh, Pat Hagen has got to go to clinic. Uh, so we're going to move him up. So the pending trials. Um, and I think you saw the ECOG trial, right? The mantle cell. Oh, yeah. Let's do the mantle cell. Yeah, sorry. So uh, I'm looking ahead because the slide changes. We got all A's and ones. So uh, anyway, so the rituxin with or without stem cell transplant for minimal residual disease. Uh, negative mantle cell lymphoma first complete remission. Brian Till, sorry, Brian. Uh, this is an important trial. It's actually doing better than the Alliance trial. Go for it. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. To, to get advanced, uh, could we go to the next slide? Uh, yes, hold on one second, please. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so I had a disclosure slide, but it's, it, there was nothing relevant to this, um, to this, uh, study. So the initial management of mantle cell lymphoma is somewhat controversial. Uh, I think most people would, would consider auto transplant in younger patients in the first remission to be the standard of care based on a randomized study that's more than 15 years old, uh, and has some caveats to it, uh, and then there was subsequent larger follow-up studies, uh, not randomized to transplant, but showing that patients who got transplanted first remission after an intensive induction regimen had good outcomes of PFS of about seven years median um, compared to historical uh, controls before that kind of treatment was implemented. And um, so this has kind of become the standard of care. It, many people would consider it for younger patients, but, but there is still this lingering kind of question that uh, uh, overall survival benefit has not been shown definitively for auto transplant first remission. So there's still some, some questions here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna just shift gears to talk about maintenance therapy. I'm kind of hitting different topics relevant to this study. So, so maintenance therapy, uh, rituximab after tra auto transplant was shown in a randomized trial to have an a, a overall and progression-free survival benefit. And so that's really considered the standard of care for patients who are getting transplanted. Next slide, please. Um, it's also a reasonable thing to give in the non-transplant setting uh, with a randomized study showing a, a progression-free and overall survival benefit if you got RCHOP 
uh, for older patients in the non, non transplant setting. Uh, it's a little bit less clear for other induction regimens, but it's considered to be a reasonable choice. And to kind of, as, since we have both two arms to try to keep them equivalent, where we elected to uh, have maintenance therapy in our non transplant arm. Next slide, please. So, Mineral residual disease is, is a concept that has been around a while now in mantle cell lymphoma, and it's been shown by several groups to, uh, to be associated with, if you achieve an MRD negative complete remission after um, induction therapy, that regardless of whether it's in the transplant population or non-transplant population, uh, the outcomes are significantly better if you get MRD negative, if you're MRD negative, not surprisingly. Um, so this can be used as a we're, we're using in this study as a kind of a risk stratifying step. Uh, next uh, slide. And so we're using Adaptive's Clonaseq uh, assay for this. I think a lot of people are familiar with using, looking at the detecting the clonal immunoglobulin sequence from B cells. And so there's two steps to this. There's the ID test where you have to send off the original diagnostic uh, material to identify what the clone is that you're looking for. And then later on after induction, um, there's an MRD test to look for whether you can detect that clone or not. Um, and we're using peripheral blood rather than bone marrow for our study. Um, this is a very sensitive test that can detect uh, one lymphoma cell in a million, uh, one in a million basically sensitivity. Next slide, please. So the idea is that because we know that these patients who are in an MRD negative complete remission have excellent outcomes, um, or very, very good outcomes after induction therapy, and um, that, that basically that could be a population that doesn't need it, transplant. Um, there's, there hasn't been a randomized trial uh, for transplant or not in, in complete remission in, the, in this current era. So the first study I referenced before was <clears throat> looking at just CHOP. So that, that's really an outdated uh, regimen now. So we now have rituximab. Uh, there's also high dose ARC and other, other regimens that we've made a lot of progress. So that's on the front side and then on the back side, there's maintenance therapy after transplant that's improved outcomes. We now have better salvage uh, treatments that could affect overall survival like CAR T cell therapy. So we're now um, testing in this modern era, whether in, in these uh, better risk patients who are achieve an MRD negative complete remission, whether the addition of auto transplant in those patients uh, still has an overall or has an overall survival benefit. Um, and we're looking at six years uh, for that. So this is a long study as well. Um, we're trying to have this be as relevant as possible to the real world by allowing any induction regimen to be used. So there's really no one consensus induction regimen. There's quite a variety out there. And so we're basically allowing any of those. Um, next slide, please. So here's the schema. Uh, patients, they, uh, there's two registration steps. The first one is really just a, this registration to get the diagnostic tissue going to kind of identify that, do that ID test to identify the clonal marker. That's been present so far in 99% uh, of, of patients. So it's really almost everybody has the clonal marker identifiable. In that rare situation where they're not identifiable, they're considered MRD indeterminate and they still stay on study, but they just get automatically shunted to an uh, auto transplant with rituximab maintenance arm as sort of the, a standard standard of care arm. Uh, all, all the patients who do have a clonal marker, they get restaged after their induction with a PET CT and a bone marrow biopsy. If they are in a complete remission on the PET and the bone marrow, and they're in an MRD negative complete remission, that's the population of interest. That's about three quarters of patients or a little bit more, uh, and they get randomized. And so they're, they, they're stratified by NIPI-C to and intensive, intensive versus non-intensive induction. And then they get randomized to an auto transplant or no auto transplant. And then everybody gets rituximab maintenance for three years. Um, if, you're, if they're MRD positive or they have a partial remission, they still stay on study and they also just kind of go into this uh, a different arm getting an auto transplant with a rituximab maintenance there, but they're not part of the, the formal statistical uh, design of the study. Next slide, please. So the accrual, as, as uh, Dr. Stiff said, is going pretty well. Um, we're trying to target 689 patients uh, to, to get, the number we really care about is 434 eligible MRD negative complete remission patients. And uh, so far as of, this, this data is wrong here, it's actually October 4th, but um, as of October 4th, we've gotten 
400, actually, I think this is the old slide set. I think. So it's 428, I think, patients now. 77% um, are MRD negative. And uh, SWOG is kind of lagging a little bit behind the other groups, but we do have some sites within SWOG that are doing quite well. Uh, Kansas, City of Hope, uh, Seattle, then Utah, I didn't make, is on the newer version of slides, didn't make it here, um, are all doing, um, are on the leaderboard there. So it's, I think there's maybe 15 patients a month or so on average that we're putting on studies. So it's going along pretty well. Uh, there have been some patients who have gone to their, there's been enough patients who have refused their assigned treatment arm that it's, it's potentially going to impact our statistics a little bit. So we are looking into, there's, there's a chance that we may end up increasing the cruel number to try to bump up the number of patients who actually got randomized and got the right treatment. Um, next, but that, that hasn't, I haven't made that decision yet. Next line, uh, slide, please. Um, so uh, I mentioned this last time, but there, there was an amendment to try to allow a little bit more flexibility in the COVID-19 era to, uh, with, with respect to the rituximab maintenance. There were, I guess, some people who were wanting to delay rituximab doses to allow vaccination. Um, so we are building the flexibility to allow up to four doses of, of the maintenance rituximab to be missed. They still have to be added back on at the end of the treatment. So they still, everyone gets, still gets the same total number of doses. Um, I think in the last six months since we, we made this, there's been some new data coming out that a lot of people are familiar with. I think that if you get an CD20 antibodies within a, within a year, if you get a vaccine within C, a year of C20 antibody therapy, you basically have no antibody response to the vaccine. So I'm not sure that skipping four doses is really going to help, but uh, if you want to, you, you can. Um, the, also please make sure patients have recovered their white blood cell count before you send the MRD test. Uh, we need to get a, a certain denominator of genomes, a uh, hundred thousand genomes minimum to be able to count them truly as MRD negative. Otherwise they're considered MRD indeterminate. Um, and then, so for a lot of you on this, on this call who are on the transplant side of things may not see these patients until they've already finished their induction. And so there can be, if they come onto the radar screen or for this study, at that point, there's kind of a little more urgency of trying to get them moving to, to either get a, get a transplant or not, or make that decision. And so to kind of try to move that along, um, those two steps can actually be done at the same time where you can send adaptive, the ID test and the, the, the MRD test at the same time. And then um, they'll hold on to the, to, the, uh, to the second, the MRD test and then run it once the clone has been identified. So it kind of skips a little bit of, um, you can kind of shorten that time frame a little bit get patients moving. Um, as I mentioned, there, there have been patients who have refused their assigned treatments. Um, they do still stay on the study. And so we're, we're still going to follow them. And then we'll have, we'll probably at the end do a, an intent to treat versus an as treated um, analysis. So I think that's, I think that's my last slide. So I think I'll uh, stop here. I don't think I see any questions. Again, thank you, uh, Brian. Again, uh, it's it's important, obviously, if at all possible, to keep patients on study. Uh, obviously, we don't want to end up with a trial that has a significant proportion of uh, refused therapies uh, and because they are considered as part of the intent to treat. Uh, and hopefully, there will be 50-50, those that um, don't want to transplant or don't want um, rituxin maintenance and get the other therapy off study. But um, uh, again, uh, please, uh, part of the reason of, of enrolling patients, I think, early in this trial is that uh, they get a sense of uh, what's going to happen in the future and, and that uh, there is going to be this randomization coming down, down the line rather than uh, approaching them after the completion of therapy and saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're not going to do... Uh, we're not going to do uh, a transplant on you. We're just going to do maintenance therapy. Um, and when in reality, that's not what the patient um, uh, agreed to initially. So uh, try to get the patients on as early as possible on the trial. I think that will help a little bit. Uh, there was, I think, one comment. It looks like a question of, are these patients refusing the transplant arm or the non-transplant arm? Um, I don't have the data off the top of my head, but it is both. There, there have been both, but I think it's more, I think there are more patients refusing the transplant arm. They were, when underwent randomization, were secretly hoping to get the maintenance arm. 
and and then kind of backed out of the transplant. I think I think is the more common scenario, but but it, it's not a hundred percent that there are some in the other arm too. So I agree with Pat that uh, you know trying to get get this early rather if they already have this they've been told by their referring primary doctor that oh you're going to get a transplant and then they then they come to the to the academic center and see you see one of us here there are transplanters and say oh we have this study where you're getting randomized it's a little bit harder to make that that shift uh, mentally but. Um, I think key is, you know, just really emphasizing that if you're going to do the study, you don't have to do the studies. You don't want to transplant. Just don't don't go on the study. Uh, but if if you do want the study, uh, you know, please be willing to be in either arm. So again, there are certainly options for these patients, so you're not um, um, eliminating their potential uh, possibility of cure, including the possibility of CAR T cells if they uh, do get randomized to. Um, um, maintenance therapy and, and don't have a great response to second salvage line therapy. So let's move on next uh, uh, to the pending trials. We're going to skip A first and go to A second one. I don't know how this, uh, I sent the slide. So there's be A one, two, and three. And, and uh, so this would be 2B. We're going to have Pat Hagen talk about randomized trial of autologous stem cell transplant for patients. Responding to induction therapy of Dara Cyborg D for light chain amyloidosis. So if we can move the slides forward a bit, it's probably going to be you know 20 plus or minus slides um, to get down to where he is going to speak, and then we'll come back to the um, the CAR T study. Is that the uh, correct one right there? No, no. This is the one we just had. Oh, so I'm need... sorry about that. Give me one second. Okay, and it's the next one. Okay, sorry. Let me uh, just scroll through. Yep, this is it. Right. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Pat, for letting me go a little early. Um, so this is a trial that's been in development for about a year and a half now, um, almost two years, to, with the uh, um, help of those listed here. So this is being led by SWOG, but given the rarity of the disease, um, we've had a lot of great input from the ECOG group, um, particularly Dr. Corellis, as well as the BMTCTN, because um, ultimately this, this will be an intergroup study. And it's pretty get, getting pretty close to the finish line in terms of going in front of the executive committee and ultimately the NCI. So we can go to the next slide, actually. So this is a, an, uh, an optimal consolidation study. So we're trying to figure out, you know, with Dara, um, with CyberD having been the standard of care um, in most centers for induction, or at least certainly the LK-based induction, and with the Andromeda study re recently uh, mature with very high CR rates and excellent outcomes, really the question is, you know, do these patients with systemic AL amyloidosis still require a consolidated auto transplant um, as part of their treatment, which has by far the longest track record. So despite new therapeutics, a much longer track record for transplant. So just a little bit in way of background. So as many of us are probably aware, you know, Amyloid historically was kind of plagued by the reputation of having very high transplant related mortality, um, you know, much higher than what we see with myeloma, certainly. But more recently, really the data is clear that, at a, particularly at experience centers, so if you're doing at least three or four of these a year, TRMs are down in the two to 5% range and maybe even a little bit lower when patients are appropriately selected. Um, furthermore, as I alluded to, you know, induction therapy, which maybe 20 years ago wasn't a standard, so some sort of therapy pre-transplant is now becoming a standard, and data from the CIBMTR does really support this. Um, and then importantly along those lines, so whether a patient gets induction before their transplant and the actual dose of melphalan at the time of transplant has really increasingly been shown to be the biggest predictors of both, both progression-free and overall survival. Um, and then I think importantly, in terms of the kind of the academics of this question we're asking, you know, the, given that it's a rare disease, 
um, you know, the, the patterns around really globally are very different. So for example, in the US, this is kind of tough to tease out the exact numbers, but about a third of patients who are diagnosed with um, systemic AL amyloidosis get a, a transplant. Whereas some of very large registry study at the UK recently showed that this is much smaller in the UK and the European data actually is similar. So in the alchemy study, only about 3% of patients, and this was about a thousand patients that they followed longitudinally over a decade, got an upfront transplant. So we're talking a third versus two to three percent. So very big difference. And then I think also importantly for SWOG, um, you know, although historically these studies have been tough to enroll, there definitely seems to be an improved appetite to put these patients on trials. And this was shown by both the recently uh, completed Andromeda study, where you know they randomized several hundred patients to either get cyber DDARA versus cyber D induction. Um, and then the recently completed SWOG trial, where we looked at isotoxamab in the relapse setting, which actually improved faster than anticipated. Um, and importantly, although there's been some studies that have looked at post-transplant consolidation for suboptimal responses, no studies have actually looked at the role of daratumumab or any um, drug really as a maintenance agent post-transplant, um, whereas the Andromeda study, that was part of the design, where patients got six cycles of induction, and if they were on the cyber dara arm, they got 18 months of maintenance. And finally, the, if you look um, historically, although improved induction, transplant numbers are actually continuing to go up um, each year. So, so, you know, I think in terms of feasibility, things look good from that standpoint. We can go to the next slide. So this is the proposed study design. So again, this is a study looking at optimal consolidation. You can see the study schema there on the right. Um, and our hypothesis is that we are going to see an improved modified progression-free survival and those that get treated with upfront high-dose melphalan and consolidative autotransplant, as opposed to those who would continue their treatment with just their um, cyborg D or their BCD as their consolidation. The modified progression-free survival is a composite endpoint that was really created on the Andromeda study, but in, um, clinically it is relevant and we've decided to use this as our primary outcome because long-term PFS and survival are tough with amyloid particularly in patients who get into great responses. So this is a composite of death, clinical um, manifestations of cardiac or renal failure. And on our study, this will be objective, not subjective, um, as was part of the Andromeda study. And then the development of a hematological progression. And the primary endpoint is to show an improved modified PFS in the high dose chemo and transplant as opposed to the DARA BCD arm. The secondary objectives that we'll be looking at on the study improve quality of life, overall survival, um, organ response, so cardiac and renal, minimal residual disease negativity rates, um, best overall hematological response, hematological progression B survival, and although it's cut off there at the bottom, actually treatment-related mortality. So not just transplant-related mortality, but both on the both on consolidation arms, both their DCD and transplant, um, the mortality related with treatment. Because as anybody who treats amyloid with any sort of frequency, we do see, unfortunately, deaths with induction therapy, just as we do with, with transplant. Um, the enrollment, again, will be based on eligibility. I'll talk about this on the next slide. But all patients will get two cycles of DARA BCD. And if deemed still transplant eligible at enrollment and after two cycles of induction, patients are then randomized one to one to complete four additional cycles of DARA BCD or high dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplant. And then both arms will complete a total of two years of daratumumab, so 18 months of maintenance. Um, we can talk a little bit why two cycles were chosen, but it, it basically has a lot to do with the data on the Andromeda study, which showed very quick, deep responses, patients getting into VGPRs within a month and CRs average time two months. So again, this is the question, patients who get into deep responses, do they really still benefit from high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant? And importantly, just as we just talked about in the last study, what we don't want to see happening is patients enrolled um, and get into a deep response and then being pulled off study because they don't want to move forward transplant. So, you know, it, the randomization will actually occur at the time of enrollment, um, which we think is an important detail. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the inclu inclusion criteria, so they have to be a transplant candidate both at the time of diagnosis and the time of stem cell mobilization following two cycles of induction therapy. Ultimately, we feel strongly that in order to kind of at best answer this question, the transplant candidacy will be, will be left up to the transplant center, although following the Mayo criteria, which some of which are listed below, will be um, highly encouraged as will melphalan at a dose of 200 milligrams per meter squared. It will be encouraged, but again, not mandated. Dose-reduced melphalan at 140 milligrams per meter squared will be, will be allowed. 
patients must have a supine systolic blood pressure greater than 90, and then some important cardiac markers that are listed here. I won't go through in detail, but these are pretty standardized in terms of Mayo criteria. Importantly, um, patients have to have at least a partial response to their induction, so we don't want patients with stable disease, disease continuing on, particularly the dare of um, D arm, because that's what they would get as consolidation. Um, key inclusion criteria, so they can't have symptomatic myeloma, although patients will not be excluded purely based on the plasma cell percentage in the bone marrow. Um, and then again, patients who are, don't achieve at least a PR to induction, they won't be randomized, but they will be followed on a registry basis. Um, you can go to the next slide. Well, I guess one thing is, you know, one additional uh, uh, thing to point out is that um, we will not, um, uh, stem cell mobilization will be encouraged as a non-transplant arm, but not mandated. And that has a lot to do with insurance coverage and some other logistical issues we've seen on other tri transplant trials in amyloid. So in terms of what do we, what do we need to do statistically? So we, we know that we're going to lose some patients. So based on induction data recently, Andromeda and others, we're, we expect about 5% of patients won't achieve at least a partial remission. And then we're estimating anywhere from 5 to 10% will be lost um, due to toxicity. Um, the median, the median um, modified progression-free survival based on our best estimates from data from the Andromeda study is 31 months. And we think we'll need, um, we've hypothesized that on a two-arm trial, we'll need 119 pa uh, patients total in each arm, so 238 total in the study to detect a 90% power for a hazard ratio of 1.6. So this will correspond to an improvement of uh, from 31 to about 50 months in the modified PFS from the transplant and the non-transplant arms. And so assuming a two-sided alpha value in an accrual period of four years, the follow-up, this is what we're looking at. We would need um, a total of 298 patients enrolled on the study um, with, an 20, with an anticipation that about 20% in total will end up being ineligible due to toxicity, dropout, or lack of response to induction. Um, so in terms of our total enrollment, we feel it's actually very reasonable. Obviously, the total number that we're going to need to register and crew is, is, is high, but we think that this can be done, um, particularly over a longer um, time period. Can go to the next slide. I think this is my last slide. So this is a few aspects of the trial that are under um, development still. And please, if you have any um, thought or input where we're looking to, to further design the translational as well as the patient-related outcomes, Currently, based on SWOG rules, we, uh, we know that we can bank both peripheral blood and bone marrow specimens post-induction consolidation and then one year post-consolidation. So we have these three time points that are guaranteed, but this is still a little bit of a work in progress, um, as are ultimately the patient-related outcomes. We actually feel this is really important for this study because long-term, in terms of relapse disease, obviously, we're going to see big impacts on our our PROs, as well as short-term. So we know that there certainly is toxicity with transplant. Um, so, but will that be off balance by the ongoing use of Velcade causing um, neuropathy, for example, in a non-transplant arm, which is certainly something that we see. So both of these we feel are, are really important to um, not only answering the primary question, but ultimately when patients are sitting down in front of us in clinic, we can have a better discussion about truly what is the impact and the role of high-dose chemotherapy um, in these patients. And I think that's my last slide. This is what it would look like if everybody was here in person. Um, but that's all I have. I'm obviously open for questions either directly or um, reaching out through email. But you know, I think this is a study you know we're very excited about in SWAG. We think this will be a, a landmark study that'll we hope change the standard of care. You know, we feel that the Andromeda study, although an important study, kind of asked the question we all somewhat anticipated the answer to that DARA-based induction improves at least you know response rates. But the big question is how do we keep these patients in remission for long-term and, and can we avoid the toxicity of transplant? Um, and, I, you know, we feel um, that this is the best way to answer that, those questions. Uh, so our transplant, so there's one question, our transplant numbers given the conventional therapy arms going up or down in the U.S. I have, so the data that I have is the last updated data I got from the CIBMTR. So I don't know what the 2020 data is. I, in 2021, you know, I, I imagine are going to be impacted a little bit by COVID, but based on my last discussions with the CIBMTR, they've not seen big changes, but I can certainly provide those updated numbers, definitely at the next SWOG meeting, if not sooner. Okay, any other questions or uh, comments? Uh, we hope, obviously, that if this trial goes uh, 
the next step is to go to the executive committee and then uh, hopefully on to CTEP. As Patrick uh, did mention, this has uh, broad um, interest in uh, the cooperative groups and there is definitely some interest in the BMT CTN, whether they would endorse this or not uh, remains to be seen. Um, they have seen this in a very preliminary form um, and um, obviously there are some questions about the maintenance, et cetera, that um, uh, we will have to deal with down the line, um, but uh, um, so far so good. And I appreciate all the hard work that uh, Pat Hagen has in, in uh, shepherding this through the, um, the system so far. Perfect, thanks. So then let's move back then to the, um, the CAR-T consolidation trial, which actually has a SWOG number. It's SWOG 2114. This is the randomized phase two trial of consolidation therapy after an incomplete remission following commercial CAR-T therapy for relapse refractory DLBCL. Um, and we're gonna have uh, three speakers today, Brian Hess and Nasheed Hussein, who are the, the SWOG leads for this. And Dr. Niljan Gosh is gonna talk about uh, the treatments uh, that we're gonna be using uh, based on early data from the phase one and phase two studies. So we're gonna take these in order. Uh, again, this has a number, SWOG 2114, and I'll let Brian and uh, Nash uh, talk about his current status as we get through this. Great, thanks Dr. Seth. Um, if we could uh, go to the next slide, please. And this is just like a member to the, uh, the, uh, the committee, the subcommittee that's kind of working on this concept of kind of a broad group of people involved. Uh, next slide, please. So the background is, you know, based on real world experience thus far, looking at three FDA approved CD19 CAR T constructs, the overall response and complete remission rates are ranging from 80% and 40 to 60% respectively. And, you know, one thing that, you know, like a lot of us have have come across when we look at the papers and in, in our own experiences that despite you know like our initial experiment excitement and uh, success of CAR T cell therapy, a large number of patients will relapse, and those relapsing have minimal responses to other lymphoma therapies, and often they have a very poor prognosis for us, like what to do next. Um, what we have also seen with further follow-up, long-term follow-up with a lot of these clinical trials is that the best outcomes are seen for those who achieve a CR as their best response. And looking at the literature. Um, we can see that 65 to 75 percent of patients in a PR and 90 to 95 percent of patients with uh, stable to sit day 30 post CAR T infusion will ultimately progress, progress usually before the uh, you know, day 120. In contrast, you know, patients who achieve a CR seem to have relatively good out and good to excellent outcomes with 65 to 80 percent of them achieving a durable response with ongoing follow up. And so, you know, looking at the patients who, you know, do not achieve a CR, this looks like, you know, a patient cohort who has kind of an unmet need and forms a basis for this proposal. Um, looking, you know, what do we, you know, what would be the next steps for these patients? Uh, next slide, please. So, the objectives of this trial, the primary objective is, is to compare the progression free survival at one year in patients who have relapsed refractory diffuse large piece of lymphoma or follicular uh, grade 3B lymphoma with stable disease or a partial response on their first imaging response assessment after commercial CD19 CAR T cell therapy. Um, and we're looking really at you know, you know, those who receive consolidation therapy versus those that receive no consolidation, aka like a control observation cohort. Secondary endpoints of the, uh, this trial include looking at the overall survival in patients randomized to consolidation versus control. We look at the complete, um, the complete remission conversion rates up to one year uh, post car in the patients look in consolidation versus control arms. We evaluate the treatment related adverse events in those who are randomized to consolidation versus control. And now, from a more of a translational medicine standpoint, to look at the association of non invasive minimal residual disease testing uh, based on like next gen sequencing uh, CAF C platform based on first imaging responses after commercial CD19 CAR T cell therapy and how that relates to progression pre survival. And also to look at the concordance between the total metabolic tumor volumes and the rates of complete remission conversion to CR up to a year in patients who are randomized consolidation versus control. Next slide, please. So this is the basic trial schema for the um, for this concept, and it kind of has a two-step registration. Step one is pre-CAR when a patient is uh, identified as being, you know, eligible for CAR T cell therapy. Um, 
And once they're registered and they undergo their, you know, undergo their lymphoid legion and their CAR B cell infusion, at the time of first, uh, you know, their first imaging response around day 30, this pet with CG will be centrally reviewed with a 72 hour turnaround time with a response assessment made based on Lugano criteria. And then based on this, then patients will be, uh, you know, uh, randomized treatment versus observation in a one to one to one to one randomization where they plan for a total of 120 patients in that step two registration, um, being in this case with disabled disease or PR. Um, and then what's not shown in this slide is a little bit out of date. You know, we anticipate needing to look at least have a 360 give or take patients in that step one registration based on the assumption that 35 to 40% of those patients treated initially with CAR T cell there, a CD19 CAR, will be uh, you know, having either a partial response or a stable disease as a early response at day 30. And then once you know they go to that scene you know, that second registration, they will be randomized. You know, these are the partial response of stable disease patient, patients. It will be randomized to one of four different, um, you know, uh, three different intervention arms or a control arm. At the same time, you know, those who under have achieved a complete remission will undergo surveillance per standard of care. Um, and so will not be registered for treatment. And those who have progressive uh, disease will be treated at the discretion of the treating MD. Once again, not a um, not a, a candidate for like registration to the treatment arm. And then here we have some of the, you know, the intervention arms that we're, we're looking at. I um, mean, you know, arm A and C includes mosentuzumab, plus or minus polituzumab. And then arm B looks at you know, polituzumab by itself. So it's arm A is mosentuzumab, arm B is polituzumab, it's monotherapy. Arm C is the combination of the two agents. And then arm B is the observation control arm. Um, as far as as far as inclusion criteria is concerned for registration, at, you know the first registration when patients are you know, being being eligible for CAR T cells, they must have a diagnosis of DLPCL or follicular three B and receiving a commercial CD19 CAR. Breaching is allowed, but they're not allowed to receive either polizumab or mosentuzumab as part of their bridging therapy. Um, however, they are allowed to receive polar mosentuzumab in the past, but cannot progress more than twelve months of receiving either of these agents. The exclusion criteria includes receiving a non-commercial CAR T cell therapy, having active CNS disease or CNS disease prior to CAR T infusion or at the time of second registration, having a Richter's transformation or mantle cell lymphoma, or having a history of a previous CAR T cell infusion, meaning this would be like a second or third subsequent CAR T infusion for the patient. Next slide, please. And this is a little bit busy, so just bear with me. Um, so for the second registration, now, once again, all participate, participants who come to register like that step two must move around or set out in the set, uh, step one registration. They must have stable disease or a partial response on their PET CT at that, you know, that approximately day 30 post CAR T infusion for Lugano criteria. They must be age eight year or older at the time of CAR T infusion, have a perform status of two or better. They must have adequate bone marrow, hepatic, renal, and cardiac function. I mean, one probably have been participants with a documented myocardial infarction when the last six months are unstable and are not eligible. You must not have any evidence of CRS by ASTCT guidelines within a 14 day prior to registration, and no evidence of ICANS or immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity center by the ASTCT guidelines within 14 days of registration. They also cannot have any evidence of serious intracranial hemorrhage and or edema after CD19 car infusion or have any such kind of event within six months of the second registration. Not having an uncontrolled infection such as systemic fungal bacterial viral infections within 14 days prior to that second registration. With regards to their blood counts, you know, they must have an ANC of greater than 1,000 and platelet counts of greater than 75,000 within 14 days prior to second registration. With the that participants must not have received growth factor within 72 hours prior to the ANC value being um, you know, assessed for a qualification for the second uh, registration. Applications will include looking at patients who have stable disease versus partial response at day 30 and the type of commercial CAR T cell therapy received and the type of bridging therapy they may have received previously. Once again, just to highlight the bridging therapy is allowed, however, can, they cannot have received any of the, um, the study interventions of the, the specific the Mosin Tuesday methods, Polo Tuesday Next slide, please. Um, so these are once again kind of looking at the you know the, at the treatment schedules and response assessment. Um, arm A is looking at mosentuzumab alone as the intervention with a 21 day cycle where patients would receive a mil, you know a one meg dose of mosentuzumab on day one, a, a, a two milligrams on day eight, 
and system really goes on day 15 for that first cycle. And then for cycle two, uh, once again, a 21 day cycle, they'll receive most juice about 60 milligrams on day one. And for cycles three through eight, they'll can receive a 30 milligram dose of most of two on day one. For arm B with the polituzumab arm, they'll for cycles one through eight, it'll be once again a 21 day cycle uh, with the dosing of polituzumab at 1.8 milligrams per kilogram. For the combination arm, arm two with most tuzumab and polituzumab, cycle one will be a 21 day cycle where they receive most tuzumab on days one, eight, and 15. And then for cycle two, will be most once again, along with a dose, a fixed dose, and go wait for dose of polituzumab. And then cycles three through eight will receive the 30 milligram dose of mosituzumab plus the in a standard dose of polituzumab. And then once again, for arm D, this is an observation that, you know, like they are not receiving any kind of intervention that, um, as part of the residency. Looking at the schedule, kind of, the, kind of like the translation medicine components, you know, patients will have, um, you know, kind of MRD assessments kind of done really pre lymphodepletion looking at that day 30 in, con in conjunction with their PET CT um, assessment. Also looking at day 100, day 180, and possibly day 365 post car. I'm trying to look at what, you know, kind of, kind of doing these uh, draws in accordance with when they're having the imaging assessments. So the overall end point or goals for this trial um, is, you know, the study needs to be kind of, you know, completely with the cooperative group setting, you know, to the cooperation between SWAT, the Alliance, the ECOG, and the BMCTTN. It was choose, chosen as one of two proposals for the BMCT and Lymphoma State of Science Symposium to be presented to the BMCT and SOS meeting in March of this year and was ranked fourth overall number one lymphoma proposal as the number one lymphoma proposal. And the biggest thing to keep in mind is if consolidation therapy appears safe and effective compared to control, this may lead with the groundwork for a phase three study hopefully being performed where we may be able to utilize the MRD assessment to help guide you know intervention versus not. At the same time, the consolidation therapy does not appear to be safe or effective. It at least may give us more insights regarding MRG assessment using CAPSIC and NGS platforms um, in the setting to better understand uh, kind of our ability to uh, assess the response to CAR T cell therapy. And this kind of builds on kind of some of the recent um, studies that have come out looking at kind of MRG assessment in this setting. Um, I believe that's kind of our last slide for the, you know, the overall um, protocol presentation. I think Dr. Goethe was going to, uh, would be kind of, uh, Kind of having a couple of slides on the actual intervention, like a little more detail on the intervention, so that we're, we're looking at as well. Okay, well, let's uh, hear about the uh, efficacy of the therapy that we're planning to give. Dr. Gosh. Thank you so much, Dr. Stiff, and great presentation. Uh, so I'll be talking about, hold on, let me just make sure I have a video. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll be talking about the preliminary data with mosinotuzumab and polituzumab for relapse refractory uh, B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which uh, presented at EHA earlier this year. So next slide, please. So we, we, uh, we know about mosinotuzumab. It's a CD20, uh, CD3 by specific antibody and, the, uh, and has good activity as a monotherapy, but and, you know, in combinations is is where the future is. Uh, I think for uh, for for this these bispecific antibodies, at least in selected situations, uh, we know about polituzumab, uh, which is already approved uh, in uh, in uh, aggressive uh, non hodgkin in DLBCL in uh, you know in the relapse refractory setting. And in a mouse xenograft model, there's been. Uh, synergy between mosinotuzumab and polituzumab is sh shown in the figure on the right. We can see the combination, uh, you know, led to a significant reduction in tumor uh, volume compared to single agents. And that formed the basis of uh, this phase one study to look at, uh, you know, to study, you know, uh, the, the combination of mosin plus pola and uh, to also get the RP2D in addition to some uh, toxicity and obviously efficacy data. So next slide. So here is the design of the study. Uh, you know, here, you, uh, the step-up dosing uh, was designed primarily to lower the risk of CRS. And as was shown uh, recently in Dr. Hussein's slides uh, with, with the step-up dosing uh, in, the, in the planned uh, post-CAR-T study as well, 
Um, and here you can see that there were uh, increased step up doses of one uh, on uh, given uh, uh, on days one, eight, and 15 of cycle one. And then after that, you know, it's day one from cycle two to cycle six. So a little bit different than what is being planned. Uh, uh, the polatuzumab in this case stopped at cycle six. Uh, and, um, you know, most anatuzumab was continued for up to eight cycles for those who uh, were, attained a complete remission. And for patients who were in a partial remission or, or stable disease, most anatuzumab is continued for 17 cycles. So, and then, you know, uh, different doses were, were tried. The 60-30 dose was, uh, was uh, you know, the, the RP2D. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look at the data for the different dose groups as well. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the design of the study. And then uh, we can go to the next slide. So here are the baseline characteristics. So um, uh, median age was 70. Uh, you can see that it's primarily aggressive histologies, DLBCL, follicular lymphoma 3B, and transform follicular. So those were all the aggressive. There were three patients uh, in the first 22 uh, patient cohort, uh, where, uh, which was the uh, dose escalation cohort who had follicular lymphoma grade 1 to 3A. Uh, all these patients had good performance status. And then when we look at IPI score for the aggressive lymphomas, you know, uh, you know, there were um, a, a good proportion of patients who had uh, IP, high IPI. And then uh, prior therapies, median prior therapies three, uh, there were a small number of patients, but, uh, you know, because the overall N is small, uh, it's almost a third of the cohort, which is post, uh, which had uh, failed CAR T therapy. So these are patients who progressed after CAR T. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at the whole group, you can see that this is a pretty sick population, 82% refractory to last prior therapy, 91% refractory to last anti-CD20 therapy. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a summary of the adverse events. All patients had some adverse events, about 86% of patients had treatment-related adverse events. Uh, in terms of serious uh, treatment-related adverse events, that was 23% uh, of patients. Uh, yeah, grade 3, 4 treatment-related adverse events were seen in about 50% of patients. To, uh, there were two patients who had grade 5 adverse events. These were not deemed to be uh, related uh, to the study treatment by the investigator. One was a sudden cardiac death. Another one was a respiratory failure. There was a dose-limiting toxicity of grade 3 new onset atrial fibrillation. Uh, which was seen the most common, uh, most frequent treatment-related adverse events were neutropenia and nausea, uh, followed by fatigue and diarrhea. Next slide. So now the uh, adverse events of special interest uh, is very low incidence of CRS, as you see, just two patients, 9.1%, and they were all grade one. Both of them were grade one. Uh, so obviously no use of tocilizumab, no ICU admissions, no vasopressors, kind of you get an idea from the grade one nature of this. Uh, these patients primarily had, uh, had uh, pyrexia. And then uh, infections were seen, uh, as you'll see, there's neutropenia. Uh, and so there were infections, 32% uh, uh, of patients had infections, uh, mostly grade one, two infections. Peripheral neuropathy is expected uh, with polatuzumab, obviously, and you're also seeing some grade three or higher peripheral neuropathy. So it's something to think, think in mind if you're thinking of, you know, a little more cycles of polatuzumab uh, on your study as was uh, compared to this one. Uh, so 41% incidence of peripheral neuropathy. Next slide. There was, oh, very importantly, that there was no incidence of any eye cans. Uh, so uh, obviously we are interested in responses. The, the numbers are small, but uh, you can see very encouraging responses. Uh, when you take all patients together, 68% uh, overall response with a 55% uh, CR rate. Mm -hmm. and looking at just the aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma cohort, 63% uh, and then 47% CR. For the post-CAR T cohort, very small numbers, so things can change, obviously, with one or two patients going the other way. 57% uh, response and 28% uh, uh, complete response, and everybody in all the three patients with follicular lymphoma uh, grades 1 to 3A had a complete response. 
So overall, very good responses. Uh, you'll see a, a, a larger cohort being presented at ASH and uh, even more encouraging results uh, than, than what, is, what is shown over here, including in the post CAR-T population, which is a significantly higher number. And unfortunately, I was hoping that the ASH embargo will be lifted, uh, but that won't happen till uh, the first week of November. So not able to go uh, more into details, but please look out for that data with a much larger cohort of patients at ASH from the same study. And that's the dose uh, uh, expansion cohort. Next slide. So this is just a waterfall plot showing that most patients had uh, nice tumor reductions. We can go on to the next slide. So I think this is an interesting slide. Uh, this is the swimmer's plot. If you're looking uh, at the different cohorts, you can see, you know, it started with small doses. So here, this is an aggregate rate of the dose uh, escalation cohort. So you start with lower doses, but even in the one, two, nine milligram cohort, uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, in the one, two, 40 milligram cohort, the one, two, 20 milligram cohort, and finally the one, two, 60, 30 cohort, which is what was the, uh, was the dose uh, expansion cohort and that's where the RP2D was. So one thing important and, uh, now, uh, is that you can see with the, plus, with the cross sign or the plus sign, uh, it's difficult to see over here because of, uh, of the color. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like it didn't come through. Um, the plus sign indicates completion of treatment. And so you can see that there are a significant number of patients, all these uh, blue circles are complete remission. And so you can see that even after stopping therapy, these are median three prior therapies, mostly refractory to the prior therapy, most recent prior therapy. And, uh, 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 and then, uh, you know, you can, what you can see over here that the remissions are sustained even after stopping treatment and some uh, for much longer. You'll have, again, much more information about this in the, in the, uh, at, at ASH. But um, you know this is very encouraging. In the second patient in the in the first cohort, there's a triangle at the end, and that's retreatment because this patient eventually relapsed, but has now gone back into a complete remission after retreatment with Mosin-Cola. So something to consider because this is fixed duration therapy. But you can see that a substantial number of patients have stopped their treatments at that six to eight month mark, and they are continuing to maintain their CRs. Uh, after stopping. So I think that is uh, clearly a very, very encouraging sign for this uh, patient population. Uh, and the next slide, and I'll address all the questions um, after this. So, you know, there was also some correlative studies. There was, uh, you know, evidence of interferon gamma production and T cell activation, although these didn't really correlate with uh, the clinical responses, but the numbers are small and I think cytokine measurements can be erratic. Uh, so, uh, but at least there was evidence of, uh, of these uh, T cell activation markers. Next slide. So just to summarize uh, acceptable safety profile, and we can talk about the neutropenia, especially relevant to, uh, uh, you know, this, um, uh, to this uh, relevant to the study being planned, since you are taking patients who, who would have had an assessment of PR or SD at day 30, which is when many of our patients post CAR T are still uh, cytopenic. Um, so that may be something to think about, uh, that they may just have borderline uh, you know, counts and get in, and then they can get neutropenia. On this study, GCSF was allowed. So obviously, I'm guessing that on, um, on the SOAG study, GCSF, I'm guessing, will be allowed. There was no febrile neutropenia. There were increased infections. Uh, but there was no febrile neutropenia, which was noted. And that's, I think, because of liberal use of uh, growth factors when patients became neutropenic. Uh, so that, I think that was one of the questions from Dr. Stiff um, about, about the neutropenia issue. Uh, and then um, uh, in terms of uh, CRS, you saw that it was just a few patients with grade one CRS and no ICANS. Uh, efficacy was excellent. Uh, again, more to see at ASH. Uh, and very, very uh, good activity in the post 
postcard T population. And most importantly, that this is durable, which is really very interesting. Many of our bispecific antibody studies seem to be, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, in, indefinite treatment, which is not really the way to go, I think, for DLPCL or aggressive lymphomas. Uh, but this one is uh, defined duration treatment. And also uh, the, the numbers are small, but obviously the uh, dose expansion cohort is still ongoing, uh, nearing completion now. Uh, there is no mandatory hospitalization uh, in the dose expansion cohort because of uh, because of uh, the excellent safety in the dose expansion, uh, uh, dose expansion, uh, uh, sorry, escalation cohort. So I think that's very helpful in the COVID era to not have any hospitalization. And uh, you know, I think that's probably the last slide. Maybe one more. I, don't, I think that's the last slide. So let me see what all questions you have. So. Uh, I think Dr. Stiff said myelosuppression. So I think, like I said, I would expect uh, more myelosuppression here uh, because of uh, putting them on study pretty early on post-CAR-T when uh, many of them would have not completely recovered their counts. And I saw that you had a 72 hour window for growth factors. So I'm sure if someone gets, you know, pegged GCF, GCSF, uh, you know, a week before, the, then maybe a week within the study, they could start, um, you know, dropping their counts. So I think thinking about DLTs and things like that, we should be a little bit careful knowing that this had a 40% incidence of neutropenia. Um, so that, and then uh, data on what happened to endogenous CAR T cells in the CAR T failures and the increase in CRS in that population. Uh, no, uh, don't have, I don't know, uh, I haven't seen the data, whether they tracked CAR T cells. Um, you know, this is a, a Genentech Roche sponsored study, and I, I don't think that, that CAR T cells were really tracked on this, uh, on this study to know what happened. And I'm not aware of any increased CRS in this, in this subpopulation. As you saw in the first 22 patients, it's only two patients with uh, with grade one CRS. And, you know, sometimes when you have a fever right after these bispecific antibodies, we obviously put this down as a CRS, but they're getting an antibody and it could have been an infusion reaction as well. So it's hard to tell sometimes. So that um, Brian asked, um, insight into DEX premeds. Yes, DEX premeds are given for these patients uh, and growth factor use is liberal. And then uh, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, so I uh, do you expect the response uh, post CAR-T may differ depending on CAR-T patients receiving initially X cell, T cell, cell versus lysocell. I don't, you know, I think it's different, right? Uh, from what I, what I understand, you know, the CD28, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, co-stimulatory, there's a rapid increase and maybe the, uh, the CAR Ts may not be detectable for a very long time versus the 41BB constructs uh, may linger around for a little bit longer. So at the post 30 day mark, I'm guessing uh, CAR Ts are still going to be there. So an early intervention like this, we should still have probably CAR T cells, uh, you know, for all three, uh, but, you know, um, I think it's going to depend on the kinetics I don't think it's just dependent on the construct. It also depends on certain patient factors. Uh, you know, the level of, uh, you know, the, the, I think, you know, factors in the host. Uh, so uh, I don't think we really know uh, whether it's going to differ between these, but I think we had that discussion. We had discussion about this study. It was very highly regarded at BMT sauce. Uh, you know, this is a, a place of really unmet need, both this and postcard failures, but this especially. I saw the recent publication which came out of Stanford with the circulating tumor DNA in the postcard population. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I see that that's one of the endpoints. But if I remember correctly, there was, um, you know, uh, for those patients with PR or SD, maybe who are negative circulating tumor DNA one might think that is there a possibility for uh, a PET CT just being called as positive just because there's a, a little bit of a immune flare in a lymph node. 
and not all PRs are the same. So I think the question with a very borderline PR versus a really uh, true PR is uh, remains a fraction of these PRs, as you know, converts. And I think that will be something to, to monitor. And you do have an observation arm. Um, so, you know, it's very hard to randomize between uh, a real PR, which is bordering SD, versus a PR, which is bordering CR. I think that's the real challenge over here because unfortunately, you know, we don't really have a VGPR in, uh, in lymphoma. And um, that's, the PR is a pretty broad category. So I think that may be a little bit challenging, I think, but I still think this is a this is an awesome study and this is probably the best combination uh, treatment. And you'll see some really good data at ASH in the post CAR-T population, further enhancing your view of uh, why this is this would be a really good thing to, to try. And I think it'll certainly be better than Mosan alone. We have seen, I think, a 19 or 20% CR rate with Mosan, single agent, based on Steve Schuster's uh, presentation at ASH a couple of years ago. Okay, I really appreciate everybody's uh, uh, updates. And I agree, I think uh, the next step uh, after this trial is maybe to come up with an early relapse trial so that when we're watching these patients very carefully and at day 30, they're in uh, a PR or a plus or minus uh, or stable disease and uh, uh, they're getting another PET CT in 30 days and looks like they're progressing to go on a, a companion trial that's yet obviously to be developed. So that's something that uh, some of you out there might be interested in, in uh, bringing forward. Uh, so where does this trial stand? I'll, I'll ask Brian or Nash to kind of update us as to where we stand with this current trial. So we got, um, this is Brian here, we got the CTEP approval last week and Nash and I met with uh, SWOG coordinators and proto protocol committee yesterday and we're planning on a, uh, what's called a rapid call in November, which is where we um, basically go over the entire protocol with uh, um, a, a list of investigators, including Nash, I, you, Dr. Stiff, and then um, we'll be sending out an invite to Nilanjan as well. Um, hopefully he can come and some of the ECOG uh, Alliance BMTCTN folks. Um, Nash and I are presenting at BMTCTN later this month to get their official approval. And they've been, um, as Nash said, have been really helpful with the SOSS. So hopefully, um, you know, after that rapid call, we'll have the protocol set um, in December, if possible. Yeah, I think as Brian said, we're trying to kind of move along pretty quickly on this right now. So yeah, like trying to get like, you know, a status post like that CTIP approval, trying to in the next month or so, trying to get at least the preliminary version of the protocol together and then having it out for further review by the, you know, first part of December and then see where we go. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all of your hard work in getting this uh, done and uh, getting it through uh, the steering committee on the first try. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of preliminary work done. Uh, we appreciate Rich Little's uh, input into helping uh, the move this forward, uh, both at the design phase and through uh, uh, CTEP. So uh, uh, if you're on the call, uh, thank you very much. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, next is the ECOG uh, uh, led uh, chemotherapy versus immunotherapy salvage prior to auto transplant for relapse refractory Hodgkin's disease. Dr. Ken Cree has been very patient and waiting online and uh, will present uh, the latest update of this uh, intergroup trial led by ECOG. Great. Thank you for allowing me to present. Um... Okay, so I'm Vaishali Kenkre uh, from the University of Wisconsin and representing ECOG in this study. Um, so this is a phase three trial that we have had a working group um, for several months now with members of ECOG, SWOG, Alliance, uh, COG, and BMTCTN. And um, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the story of how the trial came together and at the end show you kind of the schema that is uh, currently um, what we're working with. Uh, next slide. So just for a little background, as many of you know, frontline therapy for classical Hodgkin lymphoma is curative for a majority of patients. Um, but for those who are not cured, salvage therapy followed by high-dose chemo and autologous transplant 
is what is typically offered. And we know that with this, we can actually see durable remissions and potentially cure in over 50% of patients. Um, and we do think that the consolidative transplant aspect of it does significantly improve progression-free survival and possibly overall survival. Next slide. So we were charged with the question for this study of how can we do better than this current standard of care? Next slide. We know for, from a long history of various salvage chemotherapy regimens um, that were studied with salvage therapy followed by autologous transplant consolidation, um, that many of the time we achieve about a 60 to 70% CR rate, as you can see there in the top four studies. Um, the GVD study was in the pre-PET era, so I think that's an underestimate, but otherwise we tend to typically achieve about a 60 to 70% CR rate with these various salvage regimens for Hodgkin lymphoma. And then when we take those patients to transplant, as you can see in the third column, often the two-year progression-free survival after transplant is running around 60 to 70%. More recently, as you know, there's been use of checkpoint inhibitor um, in Hodgkin lymphoma in general, and also in the second line salvage regimen. And so the last study mentioned there is a study that incorporates checkpoint inhibitor. And as you can see, the CR rate fell around similar to traditional chemotherapy, but interestingly, the progression-free survival did look better um, after two years following consolidative transplant. Next slide. So it's clear that checkpoint inhibitor is being utilized in second line treatment, whether in studies or sometimes in standard of care. Um, but the question we asked as part of this working group was, has the standard of care already shifted to incorporate ch checkpoint inhibitor in second line of therapy? Next slide. We conducted kind of an informal poll of ECOG investigators. And in this, uh, we asked the question after either ABVD or uh, A squared VD, um, if a patient were to relapse, what would be your go-to second line therapy? And interestingly, although we all know about the checkpoint inhibitor data, the majority of ECOG investigators did uh, report that they would typically go to ICE as their first choice. Um, so a more traditional chemotherapy regimen. Next slide. So, you know, we also then, as we were developing this study, saw the presentation by Allison Moskowitz of Pembro GVD at ASH 2020. We saw that with the incorporation of pembrolizumab or checkpoint inhibitor, that an excellent CR rate was achieved. Um, no, there were no issues with stem cell collection and adverse events were relatively tolerable. Similarly, the year before that, um, pembrolizumab with ICE had been presented, and again, similarly, excellent CR rate and generally a tolerable regimen. Next slide. And so putting all of this together, what we started to conclude is that there is promising phase two data for checkpoint inhibitor in the second line setting, and that this might increase the overall success rate after a consolidative transplant but we haven't technically proven this in a randomized setting yet um, to say that checkpoint inhibitor plus chemotherapy is better than chemotherapy alone. So this started to formulate the question for what we wanted to ask with this study. There was also discussion about whether we could potentially eliminate transplant altogether in the era of checkpoint inhibitor. Um, but generally the consensus was that we don't yet have good enough phase two data that we can really eliminate transplant and see long-term survival cure, and that we needed to see that in a phase two setting before we could really use that in a randomized setting. So we kind of settled on the question of adding checkpoint inhibitor to chemotherapy and comparing it to chemotherapy alone um, and following that with transplant consolidation to see if the checkpoint inhibitor addition actually did improve outcomes. Next slide. And so this is the schema that we have come up with. So uh, again, this is for classical Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, patients who are primary refractory or relapse after frontline therapy. They're randomized to get either chemotherapy versus 
pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy. And if you can just click next, I have a little pop-up here for the chemotherapy regimens. Is it not working? Or... Yep, there we go. Um, so the chemotherapy backbones, there will be a choice for the investigator, either ICE, GVD, BV bendamustine, or BV gemcitabine. And the investigator would choose the chemotherapy backbone for the patient prior to randomization. So if they got randomized to arm A, they would just simply get that chemotherapy regimen. If they got randomized to arm B, they would get pembrolizumab plus that chemotherapy regimen. We then decided that we would take patients in a CR or a good PR onto transplant. And we have to still iron out some of the specifics, but the idea would be to scan after two cycles of treatment. If a patient was in a CR, they could go on to transplant. If they were in a PR, I have a, a pop-up in a second here about kind of, a, just kind of going back to the last presentation of what, what do we define as a good PR um, and then if, if a patient were with stable disease or progressive disease, though, they would come off study. Um, so if you could just, again, press next so I can get the next pop up there. Thank you. Um, so we decided that a, a good PR is kind of listed towards the bottom of that little pop up there. Um, we would count a good PR as an improvement in the PET and also at least a 50% reduction in the cross, uh, cross-sectional diameters by CT. And so if a patient did not meet those, we would not consider that a good enough PR to go on to transplant. We also decided that we would give kind of a second shot at salvage. So if a patient were not in a CR or good PR and the investigator wanted to try a second line salvage, they could. Um, again, though, they would have to stay within the same arm. So if they were in arm A with chemo alone, they would have to get chemo alone, but a different uh, regimen. And same thing, if they were in arm B, they would get Pembro plus a different chemo backbone. But in other words, we would not allow crossover because we thought that would complicate the, the eventual um, results of the study. And so patients in a CR or good PR would go on to transplant. And if you can just hit advance for me. Uh, the primary endpoint that we want to look at is two-year event-free survival um, after transplant. And so we would assume based on that phase two data I showed you in that table earlier that with traditional chemotherapy, we usually are, achieve about a two-year EFS of about 65%. And we hope to improve upon that with the checkpoint inhibitor addition by perhaps 15%. And we would count an, an event as a failure to achieve a PR or CR to salvage. Um, also failure to achieve a CR after transplant. So if the patient was still in a PR after transplant, if they had progression of disease at any time and then um, death at any time. Uh, we do want to look at secondary uh, endpoints including two-year progression-free survival in the transplanted population, uh, the CR rate to the salvage regimens, um, the CR rate after transplant, and then the rate of conversion of PR to CR rate. And then I listed there a few stratification factors that we plan to look at as well. Um, next slide, which is my last slide. I just wanted to show you some of the statistics. So we approximated about 200 patients a year um, with about 17 patients a month. Um, I, I kind of mentioned that we were trying to improve upon that 65% EFS rate, and that, that was why we chose 80% kind of as in the experimental arm, uh, coming up with a sample size of 260. And so um, that is my last slide. And I saw a question about the PET review. We decided that it would be complicated to do a central PET review um, just because of timing of having to kind of make a decision and moving forward with transplant. But that was why we, we really spent a lot of time kind of talking also with radiology, nuclear medicine, and trying to define this um, PR, which we hope is a relatively objective um, way now to look at it, given that we're looking at SUVs, but also um, kind of the, the cross-sectional diameters. Uh, so thank you. Where does this uh, trial stand right now? Yeah, sorry, I meant to mention that. So we actually just presented it at, at the NCI Lymphoma Steering Committee on Friday. So we're awaiting uh, hearing from them. How'd that go? 
Uh, it's tough to say. <laughs> I think it went okay, but. <laughs> Uh, well, not hearing any other questions, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, you know, I know that uh, Memorial is doing a pilot where they said, oh, so darn good with the Pembro uh, chemo that maybe we don't need transplant. Uh, uh, where do you think this stands? I mean, obviously, I think the numbers of patients coming for transplant are less than they were 10, 15 years ago. So are we going to be able to get this study done? I hope so. I mean, I think that with that number of patients we're, we're hoping, um, you know, for I think about 18, 24 months, hopefully, so. All right, well, uh, we'll hopefully have you come on in the uh, uh, springtime or when there's an official uh, uh, protocol and a, a SWOG uh, local PI, uh, one of those uh, uh, possibilities will be able to uh, uh, get uh, updates on this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. We'd spend a lot of time on, on this jawboning back and forth. And uh, I think this is, a, this is a good study. It's to designed to determine what's the best salvage therapy. And then once we have that in hand, then we can talk about what's the best strategy for these patients, uh, possibly to not include transplant. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and so the last thing is, um, the mile match basket uh, concept uh, trial. Uh, Matt Wiedewalt is gonna present this. Let me just uh, uh, let everybody know again that the mile match, which is uh, co-headed by uh, Harry Erba, uh, as you know, chair of the SWAG um, leukemia committee is um, Patrick, I think you're muted. Muted. So I'm muted. I can't believe I'm muted. I don't know how that happened. Sorry. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so as, as a brief introduction, uh, Milomatch now has a transplant subgroup. And uh, a series of transplant trials will be part of the Milomatch cadre of trials. I like to think of these as a cradle to cure concept in which patients with newly diagnosed acute myeloid leukemia or high risk MDS will come in and, and get a initial tier trial. And then if transplants need to go on a transplant trial and then potentially on a maintenance trial as well, uh, depending on results of the induction uh, consolidation and transplant uh, that they're going to receive. Uh, so we're going to have all the data from the time of diagnosis, the time of completion of induction therapy, the time of completion of consolidation therapy, and then on to transplant. And, and uh, so these trials that uh, we're going to develop and the one that Matt's going to talk about are for patients who have been previously enrolled on a myelomatch upfront trial. Um, uh, as uh, uh, things are going, uh, the first two upfront trials have been approved by uh, the steering committee, leukemia steering committee, and those are currently being written. And this is the first uh, transplant concept that's come through. Uh, there will be others, and we're certainly uh, hoping and looking for other investigators to help uh, develop these uh, additional trials down the line, and we'll talk about this when uh, Matt finishes his uh, uh, concept. This is a concept that's been floating around uh, 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 before Matt left uh, his prior institution, and uh, something that we all have been uh, uh, hoping to get going on, and uh, I'll let him uh, introduce this, and uh, um, uh, we'll chat again at the end. Thank you, Pat, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, looks like the, there was some reformatting of the slides. This is not a BMTCTN study. Um, it's been developed within the Alliance. Um, it does have an Alliance number, 161901, uh, and it was uh, initially approved by um, the Alliance uh, Protocol Review Committee um, um, in 2019, um, but then it uh, became necessary that it kind of go into the Milo match um, uh, system um, as a tier three study. So 
The studies are randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase two study of venetoclax with reduced intensity conditioning, uh, followed by allogeneic transplant, and then venetoclax maintenance in adult patients with acute myeloid leukemia and first minimal, resi minimal residual disease positive complete remission. And I've been working on this concept with Jacqueline Garcia, um, as well as Miguel Perales and Rich Stone uh, within the Alliance. Next slide, please. The, uh, the um, original um, rationale for the study um, before we uh, change it to MRD positive only patients uh, was all comers uh, to try to address the inefficacy of reduced intensity transplant for AML, uh, specifically the very high relapse rates. Uh, here we see both in BMT CTN0901 and patients 18 to 65, uh, that reduced intensity allo transplant um, had a relapse rate um, had a uh, relapse rate here um, at 18 months of uh, about 50%. Um, similarly, in an older patient population of 60 to 74, um, the uh, CLGB 100-103 CT and 0502 study, uh, very similar uh, levels of relapse. Um, in addition, disease-free survival in both of these studies uh, was about 40 to 45% at 18 months to two years. Next slide, please. The, uh, the addition, uh, because um, this concept needed to fit into the MiloMatch initiative, um, there was a, a change to the protocol to just look at MRD positive patients um, um, to be able to assess the efficacy uh, a little bit better of the uh, treatment approach, as well as uh, it helps some with the power of the study. And basically, this is uh, the first uh, survival curve here is uh, from University of Washington, um, where patients with active disease or MRD positive disease did terribly with transplant with a survival down around 10%, um, uh, which was uh, significantly uh, lower than patients who were MRD negative going into uh, transplant. And this was with myeloablative. Um, um, Similar data seen with reduced intensity uh, transplant uh, with MRD positive patients uh, pretty much universally relapsing after transplant. Um, there's also some data to support that uh, myeloablative uh, conditioning may overcome some of the relapse risk with reduced intensity, um, although data has been mixed. Next slide, please. So strategies to improve the efficacy of reduced intensity uh, conditioning transplant, which is um, as much intensity as many of our older patients um, can take without unacceptable uh, non-relapse mortality um, due to the toxicity of conditioning, um, is to before conditioning try to eliminate minimal residual disease, and that is part of MiloMatch, some of the MRD eraser studies, uh, using more effective inductions, addition of targeted agents, um, and more effective consolidation as well. Um, for transplant itself, enhancing conditioning with novel agents um, has, has not been greatly explored, especially in allogeneic transplant, although venetoclax uh, potentially gives us a, a safe and unique option in terms of uh, potentiating um, the efficacy of um, conditioning for AML. Post-transplant uh, prophylactic treatments um, may extend uh, remission duration and even uh, potentially extend the remission duration long enough to enhance graft versus leukemia effect or give time for graft versus, versus leukemia effect and potentially enhance cure and improve cure rates as well. Um, a number of things, including maintenance drugs, cellular therapies, and immunotherapies post transplant are being uh, um, um, pursued at this time. And then preemptive treatments uh, for patients who are MRD positive. Next slide. The rationale for adding venetoclax to transplant, both in conditioning as maintenance, is that venetoclax is, has single agent activity and uh, heavily uh, pretreated uh, relapse refractory acute myeloid leukemia uh, with a CRCR rate of 19% and anti leukemic activity of 38%. Venetoclax is also well tolerated uh, with a major uh, concerning uh, adverse event post transplant, would be cytopenias, although this is usually manageable with dose reductions and holds. Um, other concerning low-grade uh, adverse events seen with venetoclax include diarrhea, nausea, and fatigue, um, which may or may not be enhanced um, after transplant. Um, venetoclax is orally bioavailable, so um, uh, more likely to have good compliance with treatment. 
And venetoclax at 400 milligrams is safe and well tolerated with reduced intensity uh, fludarabine busulfan two days uh, conditioning and as maintenance. And this um, is Jacqueline Garcia's work um, in a phase one trial in Dana-Farber. Uh, venetoclax is predicted to improve MRD clearance and relapse-free survival by increasing the efficacy of conditioning and also by delaying relapse with delayed relapse, possibly increasing uh, the opportunity for graft versus leukemia effect post-transplant. Next slide. Uh, the study design is randomized double-blind placebo-controlled, um, which is probably necessary uh, for this type of study um, in this day and age. Um, looking at venetoclax or placebo with reduced intensity conditioning. And then after transplant and after engraftment, um, patients would start venetoclax maintenance. Um, and this is in adults with AML and first MRD positive complete remission. And it, it crosses all the baskets because there may be an MDS cohort as well. That's a tier three study within myelomatch. And the proposed groups is an alliance led intergroup study and potentially BMT CTN involvement. Um, the rationale for the design is, again, blinded placebo-controlled study is more likely to keep patients on study and to prevent alternate maintenance strategies by providers. The MRD-positive population may give more efficacy data, but may slow accrual. Next slide. The hypothesis is that the addition of venetoclax to reduced intensity conditioning um, for MRD-positive AML will increase MRD clearance rate by absolute 15% relative to placebo that venetoclax maintenance will reduce, reduce disease recurrence or progression that includes MRD recurrence or progression uh, by day plus 100 compared to placebo. Um, and addition of venetoclax to reduce intensity conditioning followed by maintenance venetoclax after allo transplant will improve the 12 month disease free survival by 20% relative to placebo, estimated 15% to 35%. Next slide. Oof, uh, it's got a little reformatted in the conditioning, but otherwise okay. Um, so this is the basic schema for the study. Um, again, key eligibility adults with AML and first CR that are MRD positive, and then a cohort of MDS, uh, active disease or MRD positive disease. Um, um, the primary objectives for the study would be uh, potentially dual MRD clearance at day 30 to assess the efficacy of venetoclax combined with conditioning um, in comparison to placebo and um, a clinical endpoint 12-month event-free survival um, with events um, defined as MRD recurrence, MRD progression, uh, progression in the case of MDS, um, relapse, or death. And then key secondary endpoints include day plus 100 event-free survival and um, tolerability of the regimen. Um, patients um, who were eligible for the study, these would be coming out of the Milo match um, um, from the very top of the Milo match. Um, um, initiative um, from the uh, induction studies um, and potentially from tier two studies or potentially not. Um, and so patients would be randomized to either conditioning A or conditioning B with conditioning A being venetoclax with fludarabine and busulfan conditioning or venetoclax with fludarabine and melphalan conditioning. Um, conditioning B would be the same regimens, but with placebo. Um, the venetoclax placebo are stopped at day minus two uh, to allow washout prior, prior to the day zero uh, stem cell infusion. Patients are then um, um, go through their engraft normal transplant um, process um, without any experimental drug on board. Um, and then they will get a day 30 uh, bone marrow biopsy um, to assess disease status. Um, and if they've adequately engrafted, there will be a window for starting venetoclax or placebo, um, but um, day 30 at the earliest, um, potentially up to day 60 and maybe even beyond, um, depending on engraftment, they would start either venetoclax maintenance at 400 a day um, or placebo at 400 at, at or placebo daily. Um, a second uh, disease response um, would be at day plus 100. And this would actually be an important time point uh, for the structure of the trial um, and um, uh, has come about mostly um, as the NCI wants to try to keep as many patients who are MRD positive, um, move them to new studies. Um, so the day 100 marrow, if patients had an event um, as previously defined, they would come off study and they'll go to, we'll go to the next slide in a minute. Uh, for those that didn't uh, have an event, 
Um, they will continue either on venetoclax or placebo maintenance uh, for up to 12 months. There would be, again, disease assessments for MRD and relapse at six months and 12 months. In any event, uh, the patients would uh, go off study to potential alternate studies. Next slide. And the alternate studies, um, the hope is that a lot of patients are caught uh, with uh, MRD positivity or MRD recurrence or progression, and then they potentially have, have a marker uh, for subsequent studies uh, that would be preemptive therapy studies based on the molecular uh, features of their acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and these are just some of the potentials um, that we have uh, drug, druggable targets um, that may be options in the future, although this is not obviously developed study. Next slide. So the major uh, objectives, again, conditioning um, is MRD conversion uh, to negative at day plus 30, um, with the null being 70% and alternative 85%. So that's venetoclax plus conditioning versus placebo um, plus conditioning. Uh, the regimen as a whole, um, which includes the conditioning as well as the maintenance, um, is 12-month event-free survival with an event defined as MRD recurrence progression, uh, progression of disease for MDS, relapse, or death, um, with a null of 15% and an alternative of 35%. And then the key secondaries include relapse-free survival, or it should be event-free survival at day plus 100, um, um, and tolerability of the regimen. Um, next slide. Actually, can you go back uh, two slides? Three slides, one more. So, so there's an updated design to this, which I forgot to mention. Um, um, in, these are kind of older slides, but there's gonna be a second randomization um, in both uh, maintenance A and maintenance B, where patients will get venetoclax or placebo um, in both of these arms. Um, and, and that's to tease out um, the relative impact of the maintenance versus the venetoclax and conditioning. So if we go ahead to two slides. And so the, one of the key secondaries that's not listed here is um, a landmark event-free survival um, from the time of that second randomization, um, either to venetoclax or placebo um, with, uh, um, after the conditioning. So next slide. Uh, key eligibility, AML and first MRD positive complete remission, um, excluding APL, MDS. Uh, patients must be MRD positive for the myeloma match criteria, have a fully HLA match donor, and be aged greater than or eight, uh, equal to 18 years, although the expectation is the large majority of these patients will be over 60 years of age. The exclusion criteria, um, refractory to venetoclax containing regimen or venetoclax alone uh, for AML or myeloid neoplasm. Um, plan DLI, um, although plan DLI for dropping donor chimerism would be allowed, and then uh, HIV, HPV, HCV would be eligible if they met specific criteria. Next slide. And so the statistics um, for the conditioning, uh, we need 192 patients um, uh, to give us, to be able to detect a 15% absolute difference in MRD conversion uh, from positive to negative with a one-sided alpha of 0 0.05 and a power of 0 0.81 uh, could recruit. That may, re that may require up to 211 patients depending on uh, in a, uh, ineligibility cancellations and withdrawals. And then for the event-free survival at 12 months, um, we actually, uh, since the change in the protocol, need 98 patients um, to show a 20% difference um, in 12-month event-free survival with a one-sided alpha of 0 0.1 not 0 0.05, with a, and that will give a power of 0 0.81. Next slide, please. So the, fee, the competing study is the ABVI VLAT study, um, which is looking at venetoclax AZA versus AZA uh, maintenance after allo transplant for AML. Um, they are not looking at the conditioning question, um, and it is not restricted to MRD positive patients. Next. So this question is the suitability for MyeloMatch. Um, we feel like with the changes we've made um, um, over the last two years, it's got more momentum and really fits into the MyeloMatch initiative. Um, it is MRD driven eligibility and outcomes, which is what the NCI would like for MyeloMatch after the initial uh, tier one induction and uh, consolidation studies. 
Um, it is targeted therapy, but across AML mutational subtypes, which will improve accrual, especially for important for a transplant study. Um, phase one data has been completed, so we understand the safety of venetoclax, um, both with conditioning and as maintenance, um, and especially well tolerated, or it was well tolerated, um, although not in a randomized study. Um, allows determination of an important clinical endpoint as well. So we're looking both at uh, surrogate uh, clearance of MRD for the conditioning question, and we'll be looking at event-free survival um, through a second randomization um, during the um, maintenance phase, um, but looking at event-free survival, which we know is an important clinical endpoint. Uh, venetoclax is attractive in combination with other targeted agents as well, so looking to the future, establishing the activity and safety of venetoclax as a single agent will be important as uh, maintenance may move towards um, rational combinations of other targeted agents with venetoclax. And assessments allow uh, that, as outlined here, allow for early transition of MRD progressive or MRD recurring patients, that is venetoclax or placebo failures, to other targeted therapy protocols as available that is maintaining as many patients as possible on myelomatch studies, um, um, even, even post-transplant, um, either as preemptive or relapse refractory studies. And the other suitable thing is it's ready to go. So this concept has been um, seen by a lot of people and it's been refined um, to meet myelomatch. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. Um, there's a question from Pat regarding the uh, prelim Dana Farber outcome data. Um, I don't think Jackie has um, completely got that data together. Um, the, the patients were very high risk. I think she said the majority of them, or 80% of them, were complex with um, and a very high high percentage of p53 mutant patients. Um, uh, so it's going to be almost impossible to get you know preliminary. Um, um, uh, survival outcome data that's, that's reflective of what venetoclax may do. It's really a phase one study. So um, I know they'll, they're, they're looking now at venetoclax with azacytidine and maintenance, and maybe they'll be able to pick, compare those populations. But again, it's, it's not a randomized study and not, stratif not randomized, not stratified, all of that stuff. Okay, thanks. Any uh, additional questions uh, I can put in the chat. Uh, Harry is online and said, do any of the transplant physicians have concerns about the placebo control as opposed to best available therapy? Well, I, I think the data sh does show that uh, for, for patients undergoing transplant, majority of them are MRD, at least for a period of time after transplant. And since there is no formal study validating the use of maintenance therapy, there is no standard of care for maintenance therapy. We all, uh, a lot of us are doing it and are doing pilot studies, et cetera. I think it's fair to say that there is no standard of care and therefore having a placebo is appropriate here because uh, that may still be the best uh, option for patients because of the toxicities and side effects associated with uh, maintenance therapy. So I, I have to say that I'm very supportive of this concept. Obviously, if somebody is still positive, uh, um, you know, at, at day 30, it still could be that the patient might ultimately uh, uh, turn negative with a, a little bit more time. And obviously the graphers leukemia effect is what ultimately uh, 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 does a lot for patients uh, in terms of long-term remission. I do uh, think that uh, uh, DLI for uh, progression uh, or changes associated with MRD positivity is it still gonna be available for this trial. So yes, a little bit of a concern, but until we know that there is a, a proven uh, effective maintenance approach for these patients, I think we have to go with the fact that uh, uh, we need to have a placebo controlled trial. I don't know, Matt, do you have any additional comments? Yeah, I think most of the, you know, a lot of people have seen this and comment on it. And I think that's, that's pretty much the consensus. Um, it, it may be different with FLT3 positive patients, although, you know, a lot of the patients have to come in MRD positive. So they'll already, 
have been through FLT3 inhibitors that didn't work that well, but there may still, so, but it, it, I imagine that if a patient's FLT3 positive, um, that they, the physicians will opt not to put them on this trial, but for all the other groups, um, there isn't a standard of care, um, but I understand Harry's concern. Um, it was mine too, um, which is the, actually the reason for the placebo control is that um, the physicians, it does need to be double-blinded, and the physicians and the patients really do need in this study not to know what they're getting um, or not getting. Um, it, and because there is that desire to do something, even if it's not based on any um, uh, data, but I would hope that um, transplant physicians who put a patient on would understand that if the patient is still MRD uh, post conditioning, um, that uh, they should stay on study, especially with such a short time point to that that second assessment of MRD and disease between day, you know, thirty. Uh, 30 to 40 and, um, you know, day 90 to 100 um, and be willing to uh, keep the patients on during that time um, when other maintenance strategies may are unproven and may be very toxic during that period. Um, and obviously, if we have the gilaritinib uh, trial data from the CTN trial, that's going to impact this uh, down the line. But certainly at this point in time, we can't, we can't even claim that that's a, a very efficacious. Well, again, thanks, uh, Matt. We're getting to the last minute here, and uh, I hope that uh, all of you who are interested in these concepts uh, uh, start to think about this, and uh, more importantly, uh, join the Leukemia Committee meeting uh, that's coming up in a few days. Uh, I'm sure Myelomatch is going to be uh, one of the major uh, themes of that uh, committee meeting, uh, and you'll get a better sense of where we are nationally. And I think at some point in time, uh, 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 we'll invite uh, Rich Little uh, to, uh, uh, when, when trial concepts start to get flowing here, uh, potentially to come to this committee meeting and uh, talk about uh, where CTEP feels uh, transplant studies should be going. But again, uh, concepts are welcome. We're happy to think about these. And uh, as I listen to these uh, conference calls, uh, a couple of trial uh, ideas have come up in my mind, uh, especially for people with P53 or NPM1 uh, uh, positive disease uh, um, as uh, transplant trials as well. And so many of these patients are getting transplant. Let's use the opportunity to uh, develop some new concepts uh, to further along our knowledge of uh, uh, of this disease and um, uh, improving the cure rates if we can. So it's two o'clock, exactly. I'm so pleased that uh, uh, y'all were able to participate. Uh, a special thanks to the speakers and those that uh, asked questions. And uh, again, I um, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting, uh, certainly the lymphoma committee, the myeloma committee, and the leukemia committees. You'll hear additional concepts in the uh, area of hematologic malignancy. So with uh, uh, no further comments and thank, thank you very much for attending. And uh, I hope you uh, felt this was very useful for your uh, uh, potential uh, clinical trial uh, accruals in the future. Please support our ongoing trials. And again, uh, the new trials that are coming will keep you updated. Thank you very much. <laughs>